want to begin, actually, it's easier if I stand in the middle. <laughs> uh, I want to begin with a cartoon. If you can just pop me on, Ben, and uh, lots of you will know um, Dilbert cartoons that I use. Uh, the pointy-haired boss says, I have a bad case of imposter syndrome. And we, uh, about a month ago, I was talking in Renewal Sunday, and I talked about my own feelings of imposter syndrome, and uh, lots of folks are very kind. It's something that many, many of us feel. We, d we feel that we're somehow just about getting away with it, and if everybody knew what was really going on, we'd be in trouble. Many of us struggle with a sense of uh, unworthiness, uh, and a sense of inadequacy. I have a bad case of imposter syndrome. I feel as if I'm only pretending to be a good manager, and someday everyone will find out it's an act. And part of our issues as a, a culture at this time, in this generation, is so many of us are scared and, and feel worried, feel guilty, feel unworthy. I hope we don't have the response that the pointy-head boss has. Gilbert says, if it makes you feel any better, we figured that out a while ago. And I want to uh, show you another cartoon, which is by uh, one of my favorite cartoonists. If you, if you don't know, um, one of my hobbies is cartoons. I absolutely love cartoons. I subscribe to an inordinate number every day. And one of my favorites is a guy called Michael Lunick, who's uh, an Australian cartoonist. And the cartoon I'm going to show you is him talking to his dog. But in effect, his dog, I think, is representing God. He says, humanity, he says to his dog, humanity is in decline. Day by day, we become more horrible and foolish. I want to confess to you, he says to his dog, that I feel ashamed of my species. We are truly appalling, and I am deeply, bitterly sorry and sad. And it may be all the news that's gone on this week and every week. There are things within us that, that make us feel bitterly sad. And we look at God and we think, what have we done with your world and your planet? Where have we abandoned truth? Where have we abandoned compassion? Where have we abandoned care for others? Where is justice? Where is integrity? And he says, I want to confess to you that I feel ashamed of my species. We are truly appalling, and I'm deeply, bitterly sorry and sad. Our failure is unforgivable, he says. I'm sick with guilt, exhausted and empty from worrying about it. And he says to his dog, I beg you, please, condemn me with a look. Growl at me. Discontinue your loyalty. I offer you my hands. Please bite them. And many of us struggle with wanting to some way atone for our own mess or our perceived lack of self-worth. And self-harming, it's damaging, all kinds of things that we do to ourselves somehow to uh, hide the pain that we feel that the world and us are a mess. Please bite them, he says to his dog, who I want to suggest represents God. Those on the video are not going to be able to see what happens next. The dog licks his fingers and wags his tail and welcomes him. And when we pour out our guilt and our shame and our fear, God doesn't bring in a punishment. I don't know if I'm allowed to say he licks our hands. And those of you who don't like dogs will probably find that quite a repulsive idea. I'm a dog person, and uh, I do... <laughs> it sounds terrible. I, I, anyway, I won't say it, because <laughs> some of you are feeling squeamish already. But this sense of God responding with mercy and grace and love when we own up and confess. 
Now we're going to look at the next part of Ezra. Ezra is a book that I began before the lock time. We put it locked down. We put it on one side, and then when we began to come into the building, we looked at it because it's a, bu- a, a book of the Bible in the Old Testament that really identifies and resonates with our kind of experience. It's about a people who, through their own foolishness, have ended up in exile. Their temple, their city, their capital has been demolished and destroyed, and they've ended up miles away. But after a generation, they begin begin to return and through incredible miraculous events they're allowed to rebuild the temple and uh, as we looked at it through chapters one to six we discover how despite obstacles they get to the point after many years where they are able to dedicate the temple they set it aside that this building and it, the temple becomes in the New Testament something that's more than just a building it's a community of God's people they dedicate it uh, to God. And we looked in our last study, which was way before Christmas. You can find all of these on our YouTube channel or on our website. It's easier to find them on the YouTube channel. There's a little playlist that says uh, Ezra, and you can find up and pick yourself up and go back to those. We, we talked about how when they came in with joy, and we talked about joy, and the, the costly offerings that were made to rebuild this temple. And then there they set aside workers. I'm not going to explain that photograph. It's just a moment in our church just before Christmas. And we're going to pick it up then in verse 19 of Ezra 6. On the 14th day of the first month, the exiles celebrated the Passover. The priests and the Levites purified themselves and were all ceremonially clean. So we're going to try and explore in a few moments how we find being clean because those cartoons uh, have something in common which is this sense of shame. And one of the metaphors that we're used to in our culture is feeling dirty. How do we deal with shame? How do we find being clean? Well, they used some ritual and something that we're again really familiar with in this uh, period of our lives Isolation. They separated themselves. They didn't have to lay lateral flow tests and wait for 10 days as I did a couple of weeks ago, but they certainly went into isolation. They separated themselves out. And the passage goes on and says, the Levites slaughtered the Passover lamb for the, all the exiles. We've just sung about the lion and the lamb, the sense of Jesus who then comes on and takes on this Passover lamb. Uh, and this sense that they came together to remember and remind each other that the God they worshipped was the God who had taken them from a place of abandonment and failure and loss and imprisonment and enslavement and had brought them out of Egypt and give them a new life. And that's what the Passover was about. It says the Israelites who had returned from the exile ate it together with those who had separated themselves from the unclean practices of their Gentile neighbors. What does that mean? What it's saying is that there were folks who had been gone into exile and they had now returned, but there were people who'd stayed all the time in Jerusalem, uh, and hidden in, in buildings, who'd been, who'd been left there, and there was a sense perhaps of two communities who maybe had a bit of suspicion against each other. The people that had, uh, had gone and suffered by losing their, 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 their livelihood and their their, their family home, and the people who perhaps might be perceived to have suffered less by staying there. And we're perhaps used to our church being one of different places where we are on the pandemic, and different community feelings about masks, about fresh air and breezes and windows and open doors and and vaccines, and there's lots of different opinions, and it's actually... We need to come together, and we've increasingly been able to do that. The unity was restored, and healing and trust was developing. They ate the Passover together, these two separate experiences, two separate perspectives, two separate communities. And it says that they had separated themselves. And I want to link that into this sense of feeling clean or unclean and try and explore what that means. Why did they do this? They did it because they wanted to seek the Lord. They had a hunger to find God. And it may be, I think, that some of us, many of us perhaps, have a hunger to know more of God and his presence. And we're frustrated and dissatisfied with the sense of God that we know. And perhaps we want to know more of his love. Perhaps we want to know his cleansing and his freedom from shame 
and guilt. Perhaps we want to know his guidance and we want to sense God speaking to us. Perhaps we want to know his strength. Well, they purified themselves and they separated themselves in order to seek his presence. So I want to ask four questions and then uh, you'll see that it says to ask a question text. So Dan is going to come and, and ask one or two questions. If you've got a question, something that's not clear, something you just want me to elaborate on, something you want to say, um, then you can text that number 075. Well, you can see it there and Dan will come and do that uh, at the end of, of, of the, the, the time in a moment. The four questions I want to ask are, what did they mean by being clean? Why was purification needed? And why might might we need cleansing? And how can we feel clean? So I'm going to do a little bit of Bible study. I'm not the greatest Bible scholar in the world, so I'm going to skip over some of the stuff. Some of you, my old brethren roots, would have wanted to go spend four days on some of this stuff and would have been incredibly excited by it. I'm not incredibly excited by it, so we're not going to spend four days on it, but we are going to spend three or four minutes just to explain what it, did they mean by being clean. And there's a journey. There's many things. There's a journey from the beginning of the Old Testament through to the end of the Old Testament and through into the New Testament. This is common a lot of things. And sometimes some of our misinterpretations of the Bible and some of our mistakes are lie because we get stuck in the uh, beginning of the Bible and we don't understand the journey that it takes us on. So there are two main categories in the Bible to do with cleanliness and they overlap and they uh, feed each other. And uh, as we begin in the Old Testament, in, at rare at the beginning, the book of Leviticus, maybe Numbers, but of Deuteronomy, there are all these laws and regulations about being clean. And they defined some people and some things as clean, and they defined some things and some people as unclean. Well, what did they mean? Two categories. The first category of things that were clean and unclean was to do with care for life. The life of self and the life of others. And these were very often things that we might see now as health and hygiene. Ahead of their time, a lot of washing, a lot of hand washing. And uh, we'll we'll explore hand washing because it's the thing of the moment uh, in, in a moment or two. So there's a lot of health and hygiene, but they were therefore, they were keeping rules on the treatment of skin disease, on the treatment of corpses, dead bodies, uh, animals, and human bodies, how they handled all of those things, and way ahead of their time uh, on the terms of hygiene. And the treatment of all kinds of, I'm just going to call it bodily fluids. I'll leave that to your imagination. Those of you who like to read funny and rude bits of the Bible, you can go and look them up and find out more about all of that. The second category, and there is an overlap was that the, old, the beginning of the law wants them to, to look different to the other pagan religions around them because it's important that they depended on Yahweh, the God, uh, God alone, and that they didn't get confused and try to mix up their religions and do a little bit of this religion and a little bit of that religion. We might say it as they, 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 they had to trust in God rather than keep trying to touch wood. Touching wood is something that's got nothing to do with God. And yet so often we find ourselves mixing our religions. I have a little bit of God and a little bit of something else. I'll just touch wood. And so the laws were about being clean. Someone was clean with someone who was dependent on God alone and didn't do anything that could be construed or appeared or was part of another religion. The religion of touch wood is the religion of superstition. So they clearly had to look different. So there were things like self-control, the way they treated uh, sex. A lot of the pagan religions at the time used sex in their worship. There was often child abuse as a sexual act or prostitutes that were kept in their pagan temples. And so everything to do with sex was completely different to show that that, that sex was not a form of worship but was a form of love. And there was a reverence for life, not a worship of death. They didn't offer human sacrifices, and that's important. So uncleanliness was dealt with by isolation and a ritual that expressed remorse, expressed that people were sorry that they got involved with stuff that was dirty. Now, I said as a development, so as we get to this part of the Bible... Prior to them losing Jerusalem, stay with me if you can. I know that my voice can send people to sleep, but stay with me if you can. It's prior to this uh, exile into Babylon where they'd lost Jerusalem. 
The prophets, people like Amos, people like Hosea, people like Jeremiah, people like Ezekiel, people like Jeremiah, they had used the phrase clean and unclean and detestable practices to mean more than just the hygiene or just looking like another religion. It became the same themes, but they broadened it out. This is Jeremiah. I've seen your detestable acts on the hills and in the fields. This is God speaking through Jeremiah. Woe to you, Jerusalem. How long will you be unclean? And he's saying a whole group of people, a whole city, a whole community has become unclean. And what were the prophets talking about? You, you can go and find loads and different verses that explain. But if we take our same two categories, the first category is the care for life. They, one of the big things that the prophets say is that they had not cared for the poor. Rather, they had oppressed them. So a clean life was someone who didn't oppress the poor, but in compassion and generosity and equity, um, looked after people as equals, whereas uncleanness was to oppress the poor and to show impartiality of judges who, uh, and, and rules that were just, I'm going to be careful what I say, rules that were just for the elite and not for the poor. And that was uncleanliness. And therefore, cleanliness was to be nonviolent and uncleanliness uncleanness was to oppress, to use violence, to have blood on their hands. It was to make people work seven days a week without having a day of rest, but to exploit and to uh, um, oppress the poor. And linked to that, the second category was this dependence on God alone. So cleanliness was not trusting in any other idol, any other God, any other religion but trusting that God himself and alone would guide them. Not having animal sacrifices, not using sex, but simply trusting God. So that's their story, that those are the things that have been going on that had led them to go out and lose the city, the, the, the temple to be destroyed. Now they've come back, they've rededicated it, and they want to be clean. So why did they need to purify themselves? Well, firstly because they had to enact their repentance. It wasn't enough just to use words. And very often we have to follow through with actions. And they went through these rituals because they wanted everyone to see that they were truly sorry for what their parents and their grandparents had been a part of and what they had uh, been by uh, connection a part of. So they needed to enact repentance, but also they needed to receive cleansing. They needed to see, receive the dirt that they felt or clung to them, gone. They were a generation who felt rubbish, who felt everything had gone wrong. They didn't need and didn't have social media to tell them how imperfect they were, but they felt it. And so these rituals of purification expressed to them that they were clean. And the leaders had to do it because they had to lead with integrity. And they had to demonstrate the values and difference. So, why might we need cleansing today? Roger Scruton uh, is a philosopher. He died fairly recently, not necessarily a Christian, but a very interesting writer. He says this, those brought up in our post-religious society do not seek forgiveness since they are by and large free from the belief that they need it. This does not mean they are happy. So we may live amongst many people who can't quite understand why we talk about forgiveness, but they do understand dirt and shame and guilt and low self-esteem, but they can't respond by asking forgiveness, they respond with blame and with anger because they're worth it. So why might we need cleansing? Because when we adapt, adopt the world's practices, when we join in with our culture, we experience the same guilt and the same sense of separation from God as a community does. Because when we do not care for ourselves or for others, 
we push God away and we destroy his intention for our lives. And when we worship other gods and put our trust in something else to make life okay, we separate ourselves from God. And we need ways of coming back and being cleaned. Everyone creates their own definition. This is Richard Raw. Everyone creates their own definition of perfection that they try to live up to. And then they experience the illusion that they are either perfectly wonderful or completely inadequate. Two desperate extremes, and it's an illusion. And God wants us to discover freedom. When we get contaminated by the world not caring for the life, when we copy the world's practices, when we join in, join in with the gossip and the hurt in the office, in the family, on social media, in Twitter, when we join in with it, we feel dirty and we feel God has become distant. When we join in with the judgment and division and anger and blame of our culture, when we join in with the scapegoating of individuals and the mass shaming of somebody who steps out of line, we feel dirty and we are separated from God. When we join in with the holding on to bitterness and grudges and blame, when there are people we will not speak to or go near or have anything to do with, we feel guilt and shame and dirty. When we join in with the culture of greed, of having more and of having more than others, and a, judge, and a community that allows gross, gross in our inequalities, we feel dirty. And when we join in with seeking something else other than God to look, to guide us and to lead us, when we look for hope and meaning somewhere else, when we look for guidance somewhere else, when we look for something else to determine how we use our time and money, we feel guilt and we feel separated from God. And we wonder where God is and we wonder why our faith feels empty and dry and hard work when we put our trust in our career or when we put our trust in sex and relationships, when we put our trust just simply in self-centered pleasure, when we put our trust in being popular, popular, we feel guilty and ashamed. Another cartoon. Dilbert says, I've noticed that all of my problems are caused by other people. Yet it seems that unlikely that other people would cause me so much discomfort while I, am never, while I never bother anyone. Is it possible that I'm oblivious to my own effect on others? And Dilbert is beginning to discover one of the great secrets and mysteries of life. That actually when we stop thinking it's everybody else and we allow ourselves to think maybe there's stuff wrong with me, we can begin to find hope. The picture of me in my mind bears surprisingly little resemblance to the one in the mirror. It's easy to spot a fool unless he's hiding in you. Richard Raw says, no one willingly does evil, by which we, uh, each of us has put together a construct by which we explain what we do is necessary and good. This is the speciality of the ego. And James says, come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. With the kids this morning, I uh, ex just reminded ourselves about hand washing. We're so familiar with hand washing and why we do it, and that it protects us from harm. Uh, we're less likely uh, to contract something if we've washed our hands, and it protects others. And uh, it makes us look good. And the whole cleanliness was a lot to do with washing, and the rituals that they did was to do with washing. And I thought with the kids this morning about how important it is to wash our hands. And that is a symbol that James is picking up to use about how we wash our hearts. And there are five things that we need when we wash our hands. The first thing 
is a willingness to do it. I can stand and look at the sink. I can stand and look at the bowl. I can, uh, uh, I can go and sing songs about washing my hands. I can, I can tell other people to wash their hands. I can blame the world for not washing their hands. But the most important thing is that I need to be willing to begin, continue, and repeat my own hand washing. It's no good me expecting everybody else to wash their hands. I have to wash my hands. And I have to use water. I've got some water here. Uh, somebody told me this morning that you can't, you wa- washing your hands in a bowl of water is no good. You've got to have flowing water because it's fresh. And I was thinking how the water represents God's spirit coming into our lives and cleansing and washing us. And then we use a bit of soap. And I was thinking, you might think, what, 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 how could he what, uh, use the soap as an analogy? I don't know if I'm allowed to use it as water. There we go. The work of Jesus on the cross, taking our sin and washing us by the power of his spirit. And this feels good. And it's something we need to do to every part. It's no good if I just wash the one finger. It's no good if I just wash the one hand. I have to wash every part of my hand. And then I come into the community of the towel, the community of God's people who express mercy, not condemnation, who express grace, not judgment. And I am cleaned and cleansed. Those who keep secrets from God keep their distance from God. Those who are honest with God draw near to him. So how do we feel clean? Firstly, we recognize what is unclean within our lives. Where has there been a lack of care for others? Where, if we're honest, have we not loved as God would require us to love? Where has there been a lack of care for self? Where have we not, where have we not looked after the person that God created us to be? And where have we put our trust in something else other than God? And the second aspect is that simple confession of saying, owning it to God, acknowledging it, admitting it, being honest with him. Lord, I'm sorry, today I did this. It's not not an annual thing. It's not even really a weekly thing. It, It needs to become part of our daily routine with God. This is where I've gone wrong, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that attitude. Sorry for what I thought then. Sorry for what I said then. Sorry for the way I ignored that person then. And we ask God, Lord, will you open our eyes? Will you help us to see where we've gone wrong? And we don't avoid and we don't excuse. Rather, we repent. In other words, we choose to change things. It might be removing something. It might be avoiding something. It might be replacing something. It might be beginning something but we seek him. They did this in order to seek God. And so we seek to choose and trust his word that speaks of his love. If we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful and just and will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. We choose to trust his love. We choose to trust his cleansing. We choose to trust his guidance. We choose to trust his strength. I'm going to ask Dan to come and uh, see if there are any questions that we want to just ask for a moment or two before we respond in a response together. There are two questions for us to ponder. What is unclean within us? What is it that God's saying? Just be honest. Stop pretending. Stop Stop blaming. Stop excusing. Just be honest and let me wash it clean. And what will that look like? in our lives. So Donald, thank you. Um, We've got a few good questions in. Um, So the first one, we'll go straight into the deep end. Uh, How should we respond when people feel judged when we don't engage in unclean practices? I, I think that, so I think, uh, this is a really good question. <laughs> I finally believe that 
what transforms a person is the conviction of God's Holy Spirit in their life. Mm, absolutely. And that can be provoked by our actions. Mm. By, not by us saying or doing something negative or critical, but as you say, by us living a different life. Mm. So if I choose not to swear, for example, and that makes someone who swears a lot feel ashamed, mm. I would make sure that my words are not words of condemnation or rejection or abandonment, but I wouldn't worry that God is using my behavior mm. to... Uh, not, I wouldn't want to use the word judge, but to convict. Convict. And there's a difference. Mm. And I think too often Christians try to do the use the <laughs> try to do God's bit instead mm. of the bit we're asked to. There's a partnership. Mm. We're asked to live loving, righteous lives. Mm. We're not asked to condemn. We're not asked to judge. In a, a few weeks' time, there's a John study that's going to come out. I've already recorded it because when I had COVID, I just kept writing, doing John studies, uh, where you know, he goes on, he, he, Jesus returns to this theme that he hasn't come to judge, but to save. Mm. And I look at how if we're in the ministry of Jesus, we're not here to judge, we're here to save. Now, pure lives will cause a conviction that leads to salvation. Mm. But that's different from me going around saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're mm. wrong. Mm. It's interesting, so there's a difference between us judging people and us um, being vessels that God can, through us, uh, show them more of himself, yes. use that to convict. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. There's an interesting bit in Romans, isn't there, where Paul says about turning the other cheek, and he says about loving people who hate you, and then he says, because that pours hot coals on their heads. Yes. Which is a very odd phrase, but mm -hmm. basically he's saying, look, you be as kind as you can, and that will irritate people. <laughs> <laughs> It's a great phrase, isn't yeah. it? And he talked a lot tonight about living distinctively. Mm. So that's great. Um, this is quite a long message. It's two parts, but I'll just read it all out. Uh, do you think that our lack of repentance, i.e. still doing behaviours that are unhelpful, like gossip or being judgmental, does that mean that our Christian life can be less full because we're still living unclean lives? And then they go on and say, how do you manage the swinging pendulum of feeling like you have it all together knowing you are cleansed, and the flip side, then realizing you're totally unworthy in terms of faith? Well, I think it's a brilliant question, and, I, and, I, and I, one that we, we often talk this kind of stuff on Alpha, because mm. it's right at the fundamentals of faith. The closer we get to Jesus, the more unworthy we feel. Mm. So the, the longer and further you go as a Christian, the more you will be aware of what you do wrong, mm. and the more you will be frustrated with the things that you keep on repeating. Mm. But the answer is not to go, oh, give up. <laughs> the answer is to daily come in confession mm. and say, Jesus, will you help me again? Mm. Um, so some of us will, I think every Christian will have something in their life that was massive that God has removed and the temptation from that has gone. Mm. And after a year or two, you look back and you go, I no longer want to do that and it's gone. Mm. Every, uh, most Christians will have that after a couple of years. But most Christians will also have something in their life that will remain a battle until they meet Jesus. Mm. And it will remain a constant. It may be what Paul meant by thorn in the flesh. I'm not sure that it is. Mm. But it's certainly that, that we will battle with something. Mm. And the, secret, the, the, the issue is to say, I'm, I'm going to keep battling this. Mm. I am not going to, I'm going to get better. Mm. I'm going to allow God's spirit to, to bring more and more victory within me. So there'll be some things where we see complete victory and it's gone. And there'll be other things where maybe it is what Paul talks about to stop us from being proud or arrogant or whatever. It becomes, it's a weakness. It's there. Mm. It's a vulnerability. If we've allowed the evil one to take a hold of our life in the past, that, sometimes that area is, is weak. Mm. There's a crack. There's a flaw. Um, so there's a middle way of neither being despondent nor giving up mm. and, and just pressing on mm. day by day. Jesus, I want to be more like you. I want to... It's not easy. 
No, it's not. See, I, I, uh, I remember this graph I saw where if we start our Christian life is here, and as we grow and as we go on with the Lord, we realize more of his holiness and yeah. his perfection, how we do fall short, and equally more and more of um, we become more sensitive to our weakness and our mistakes. And yet yeah. Jesus bridges the gap and our appreciation of the cross, which kind of grows bigger throughout our yeah. life and our dependence upon grace and our love for God abounds. But it's difficult, and it leads into a question somebody said. Um, in terms of, as you said, our struggle with sin is ongoing. How then do we know if our repentance and our salvation is genuine? And not just a sign that we, we don't really believe in Jesus. Because, I mean, well, Sam talks a lot about faith and works yeah. in James, doesn't he? And faith I think the very, I think if anyone's worried about that, it's genuine. Okay. <laughs> so that's the first thing to say, that if we are fearful that we are not repenting enough, then the repentance is, is sufficient. The, mm. the, 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 at the end of the day, we are saved by Jesus dying on the cross. And the, in, the good news is he wants to save people. Yeah. It's his intention, it's desire, it's his goal, it's his passion to save people. He's not looking like an insurance company for some clause that, ought, that gives him the excuse to say you weren't sorry enough. Mm. He's looking for the glimmer, the faintest ray. So, uh, and, the, and, and then there's this element of trust and faith in Scripture. Mm. That that's what he wants to do, that he is faithful and just and he will forgive us. So I think the anxiety, am I sorry enough, is just evidence that we are sorry. Mm. And, and um, there have been times in my life where I haven't truly repented. But actually, I didn't care at those points. Mm. It's only when I look back that I realise. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yes. So if you're anxious about it, you, you really do care. Yeah, the fact that you care enough to think that way is a good sign, mm. is what you're saying. And, and, and I believe passionately that Jesus has died and placed his spirit in us and taken hold of us and he doesn't move in and out depending on how good we're being that day or how sorry we are that you know mm. he, we're a house he's bought us he owns us the deeds are his mm. there may be days when he's very very disappointed with us there may be days when we're separated and we don't feel his presence because of our stupidity but mm. we do not lose mm. his ownership of us and our salvation okay uh, last question, last question, if yeah. I may. Um, we talked a lot about God's cleansing, receiving his forgiveness. Mm. Um, what is holiness and how can we aspire to, to be holy as God calls us to be? Is that just about trying harder? So, well, ho holiness is being clean, so it's a gift from God. Mm. You know, I, I can't make my hands clean by spitting on them. I make them worse. It's yeah. when the water and the soap comes that they become clean. So we only become holy through Jesus. Holiness is being pure and set apart and devoted to God. It means that we, the easiest way of summing up is we love our neighbor mm. and we love God as ourselves. That's where we're aiming for and we deal with the stuff in our life that's not right and we keep on going. Um, but there is this constant partnership where I say, God, I need you, I can't do this without you. Mm. but I also put into practice the things he's asking me to do. Mm. And so there in, it's not just that I sit there and go, God, make me better, <laughs> nor is it I'm turning over a New Year's resolution, I'm going to be better, God. Mm. It's, God, I need your help because I need to sort this out in my life. Mm. I'm going to do this, but I need your help because I'm going to not want to do it. That's so it's a partnership. It's a relationship, isn't yeah. it? And we're dependent on God's grace for our forgiveness, our purified hearts, but also for the power to change. Yeah. Yeah, and he provides all of that yeah. in abundance. And I think what you're just saying is absolutely right. Self-condemnation tends to make us sin more. Mm. Uh, whereas when we can receive his mercy and grace... No condemnation. There's no condemnation. Mm. Actually, it helps us sin less. Mm. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Donald. Thank you. Yeah.